sleep is a phylogenetically conserved activity. It's present in fruit flies. And when I say it's present, what I'm talking about is a period of inactivity. So there's not a lot of motor activity. There's minimal motor activity. There's quiescence. And there's and an animal, an individual is not reactive to sen sensory stimuli. So uh, a period of low reactivity and quiescence. And that exists in fruit flies. It exists in, in, in all animals. Um, uh, it even exists in worms um, if, 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 during one period of the life cycle. So it's a, it's a very universal feature of animals. Um, what this, the purpose, quote unquote, of sleep is something that has been uh, addressed. Uh, people have been interested in for a long time. I'm not sure it's a question that we can, we can answer. Purpose is not really uh, one of the more popular questions these days. But, um, but certainly, we cannot live without sleep. Luckily, we don't have to learn how to sleep. We just come, we come out learning, knowing to sleep. We come out sleeping. <laughs> sleeping pretty pretty well. Well, maybe not as well as the young parents would like, but um, well enough. Uh, so um, so how, how, how is this regulated? And, and first, from a phenomenologically from a phenomenological point of view, there are two opponent processes. One is pressure to sleep. And so when you wake up in the morning, the pressure to sleep is at its, at its lowest. And through the day, that pressure to sleep is going to climb, climb, climb. And when it gets really high, uh, say around 10, 11 o'clock at night, then you go to sleep. And across the, your bout of sleep, which is going to last, say, seven hours, then the pressure to sleep steadily declines. So this is, this is a good scenario. It, it, the pressure to sleep increases throughout the day. You go to sleep, and it steadily declines. Next morning, it's at its, it's, at its nadir, and it, it climbs again through the day. Now, there is another process that is simultaneously going on, and that is the circadian rhythm. And the circadian rhythm is a rhythm that, it, that is going to push you to be aroused so that you can go out and do the things that an animal has to do, which is go out and find food and drink. Um, so eat, drink, and find other people, find other individuals uh, with whom to socialize. So these are our, you know, prime directives, and we concentrate that during a specific time during the 24-hour cycle of the Earth. Um, and and our pressure to be awake uh, is going to be highest during the wake during the daylight hours and for some number of hours after daylight hours. And then there's going to be a circadian lull. So this, the, the, the uh, circadian push to be awake takes a lull, say, around 10, 11 o'clock. So as that goes down and the pressure to sleep goes up, you have your biggest differential and you go to sleep. Next morning, Pressure to sleep is down, and the the circadian rhythm to, to be awake is is back up. Now consider the situation where you don't sleep well or you don't sleep at all during a night. Well, the the pressure to to sleep um, climbs and climbs and climbs. The next morning, you may actually not go to sleep. So why, if the pressure to sleep is so high, why don't you go to sleep? Well, because that circadian rhythm. To, to be aroused kicks in. And so you, 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 sometimes you, you feel um, after a, a full night of not sleeping that you actually can go through a day or part of a day. And that's the circadian rhythm overriding this pressure to sleep. OK, so th this is sleep pressure versus circadian arousal gives us this rhythm by which we, sl we are wakeful for, for say, um, uh, 17 hours of the day and then asleep for seven hours of the day. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the, the entrainment of sleep is the entrainment to, we, we are uh, diurnal animals. We are active during the day. Um, and, but we have to know when it's the day. And we don't know, and the way that humans know that it's the day is by light. 
Okay, so we need light coming in, and this is light that is sensed by the melanopsin-containing retinal ganglion cells, these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells uh, that are in the retina, and they project through the optic nerve to an area right here. So this is a section through the, uh, through the telencephalon and diencephalon. Here's the internal capsule. This is the anterior commissure. This, if you zoom in here, this is the uh, optic chiasm. And just above the chiasm, right there, is a place called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And the suprachiasmatic nucleus gets input from the retina, from these melanopsin-containing retinal ganglion cells, and then it projects to, amongst other places, it projects to the pineal gland. And the pineal gland puts out melatonin. It puts out melatonin every evening. And that is one of the, that is a hormone that supports your going to sleep. So this is how we entrain our sleep to the light-dark cycle. I want to make uh, a couple of points here. One is that the, uh, this system is extremely sensitive to light. So the light should come in during the daytime, and if light also comes in during the nighttime, it disrupts the whole rhythm. So even a single flash, uh, a pretty short flash of light can disrupt a rat's rhythm of sleeping, and we're probably very similar. Um, and this is why the nighttime use of, uh, of backlit uh, devices such as phones has, has really disrupted uh, people's circadian rhythm. The second point that I will make is that uh, if, if there is no eye, if there is no retina, then there's no melatonin release. And if there's no melatonin release, there is no entrainment. It's very difficult to get that sleep rhythm going. So who is this a problem for? It's a problem for people that are blind with, without a retina, so a nucleated or just no, no, um, no eye, no retina. And in, in these people, it's very hard for them to get into a rhythm of sleeping. Luckily, uh, of, in the last uh, decade or so, um, there's been a treatment which is simply, it was very simple and very effective, which is to give these individuals melatonin to take every night. And that allows them to have an extrinsic form of entrainment. Okay. Um, how much sleep do we need? Well, uh, I, I don't know, I actually don't know where the eight hours a night thing came from. Uh, I, I, it, it has no particular validity. Um, this is a really great study by uh, Jerome Siegel and, and, um, and colleagues. Uh, it's Yiddish at all, in fact, and it was uh, published in Current Biology. And what they did was they studied three uh, tribal uh, peoples who, who don't have any um, they don't have any uh, sort of modern conveniences, no alarm clocks, no electricity, no noises that are associated with the buses starting up in the morning or, or um, uh, traffic, et cetera. So they're, they're sleeping in a way that we think is, is somewhat similar to how we slept before we had all this modern, uh, these modern constraints that are, are, are um, controlling our, our rhythm. And what they found was across all three of these is that uh, basically sl the individuals slept for somewhere between six and a half and uh, or s six and three quarters and, and eight hours uh, a night. And the amount of time that they slept depended on the season. And the way it depended on the season was, was really, really interesting. So what happened was they didn't go to, they didn't go to sleep when the sun went down. That, that, that would be one guess. In fact, they went to sleep about three hours later. They, and the moment that they went to sleep tended to be the time when the temperature dropped. Okay? So as the temperature dropped, they went to sleep. When the temperature started to rise, they woke up. So what's really interesting about this is 
they're sleeping during the coldest part of the day, coldest part of the 24-hour cycle. Um, and I, and I might, you might remember that when we were talking about thermoregulation, I mentioned that there is one moment, in, there's one instance where we regulate our set point to a lower temperature, and that is during sleep. So during sleep, in, during slow wave sleep, and we'll talk about what that is in a moment, during slow wave sleep, the regulated temperature is dropped. It's instead of being 98, it's, I don't know, 96. So it goes from 37 to 36 or 35, something like that. Um, uh, and then, interestingly, during REM sleep, the t there's no thermoregulation. You're in free fall. So it, it's, there, there's been a lot of uh, places where, we th where the, the interaction between sleep and thermoregulation is, is very um, intertwined. Um, it's very interesting. So what this tells us is... Number one, eight, eight hours doesn't have any magic um, uh, meaning. And number two, we might do well by um, turning, uh, foregoing the constant temperature during the night. We might do better by trying to get a cooler temperature uh, at, to sleep in. Okay. Um, now, uh, there are different types of sleep, and one, as I said, is slow wave sleep, and slow wave sleep is, is marked by uh, consistent uh, firing in, in the cerebral cortex that gives you these slow, coherent waves in the cerebral cortex, um, and then there is rapid eye movement sleep, which is associated um, with the, the, the cerebral cortex looks as though you're awake. It looks as though you're awake, um, but you're not awake because there's still, um, uh, there, there are a few differences. Um, one is in the hippocampus. The hippocampus is doing different things during uh, REM sleep than during wakefulness. But, but in addition, you're frozen into atonia. So there is an area in the pons that projects back down into the spinal cord and hyperpolarizes all the motor neurons so that you're not moving. But there are certain muscles that are released from that, and one of those is the extraocular muscles. So the extraocular muscles are moving the eyes during rapid eye movement sleep, as the name would imply. Um, rapid eye movement sleep tends to be the time when, when people most often report having dreams, although there are dreams that are also associated with slow wave sleep. Babies have another version of sleep. They do well. No one teaches a baby how to sleep. They do it well. And they have, when they're very young, they have what's called active sleep, which is, a, which is closest to REM sleep, but is different. Now, they're going to sleep a lot more than um, six to eight hours a, a day. Okay, so how, how, what are the sleep rules? The sleep, there's, there's rules to the sleep architecture. So what happens is that you're awake and then you go down through various phases of slow wave sleep. The slow wave sleep is shown here in gray. And there's deeper and deeper slow wave sleep. Um, you enter into REM sleep only from slow wave sleep. Okay? So you can enter into, but you cannot go from wakefulness to, to REM. You have to go through slow wave sleep to REM. And then you come out of that, you go back into slow wave sleep, another bout of REM. And you intersperse these bouts, but in such a way that as you go through the night, the, in, the number of REM sleep, the, the, as you go through the night, REM sleep tends to occur more and slow wave, slow wave sleep bouts get shorter, um, shorter and lighter. Now, you can have deprivation of either sleep total, slow wave sleep, or REM sleep. Um, and, and what will happen is you'll, you'll fall asleep. If you're allowed to rebound from that deprivation, you'll fall asleep faster. If you're REM deprived, you'll, the REM, first REM episode will, will occur earlier. 
What can go wrong here? Well, one thing that can go wrong is uh, called narcolepsy, and that is the entry from wakefulness to REM during the daytime. So that's a, it, that, is a for, that is a forbidden transition, wake to, to REM, and it also occurs uh, at a non-circadianly, uh, non-circadian uh, correct time. The other thing that can go wrong with this is that, as I said, during REM sleep, you tend to have dreams. Your dream, more, more dreams occur per minute during REM sleep than during slow wave sleep. It, it kind of makes sense to me that, um, y- that the nervous system has decided to, to, to prevent you from acting out those dreams. And the way that, the, that that happens is by producing this atonia. So hyperpolarizing motor neurons so much that they can't be activated. So you can dream, I'm chasing, I'm chasing, I'm, I'm, I'm hitting, I'm kicking, I'm doing all this stuff, but I don't actually do it, okay? Because I'm atonic, I can't move. Um, now, there is a disease or a condition called, it used to be called REM sleep without atonia. Now it's called REM sleep behavior disorder. And it happens almost exclusively in older men, say 60, 60, 65 year old plus men. And they, uh, they don't have the atonia. Coupled with that, the dreams are almost universally violent. And so what happens is that they're acting out these violent dreams with their bed partner. And they're injuring their bed partner. They, they're not aware of it. They don't know that they're doing it but the bed partner does know. And this is a problem. It is also, in some instances at least, um, a, a sign, uh, an early, it can be an early sign of a neurodegenerative disease such as Parkinson's. So a person can start to present with this and then eventually develop Parkinson's. Um, okay. And the final thing that I want to uh, want to emphasize is that probably the, the biggest place where sleep in, you know, has a negative impact on our lives is that a lot of us are sleepy or drowsy a lot of the time. And that has a huge negative impact on our ability to work effectively, and it has a huge potentially lethal effect on our driving abilities. So. Sleep, falling asleep while driving is, uh, I, I don't know comparatively how that rates to um, driving uh, while under the influence of alcohol, but it is certainly a big problem. And the, in, in addition, the, the amount of work that is lost because people are just too sleepy to work at their best um, is, another, um, is another problem. Um, and, and this, this changes through the life cycle. So uh, a a third related problem is the ability of adolescents to to do their best work when they're asked to go to school um, at a time when when they are um, developmentally uh, meant to be still sleeping. So during adolescence, to ask kids to go to school at 7.30 or eight o'clock, um, that, that's asking a lot because they, they have a different, you know, the, the sleep patterns change throughout the life cycle and during adolescence, that's a time when they're supposed to be sleeping. Um, so this, these, are, these are issues where biology is gonna uh, intersect with society and with, with um, policy. Um, I don't have answers, but uh, these are important issues to consider. Okay, so we're almost at the end of our journey. We're gonna look at uh, what you can do with all this knowledge about the brain.